this is Tam Lee from Massacre, and you're listening to the Phantasm Podcast. Phantasm. Maximum Terror. Ah! That's your target audience, baby! Phantasm. You know something? I sort of enjoyed it. Phantasm. Sell the metal! Sell the metal! Sell the metal! Sell the metal! Ah! Ah! Hey, this is Dr. Vincent West, medical doctor with the Phantasm Podcast. Man, I've been waiting a long time to do this. The gentleman I'm about to introduce is a fucking legend. I grew up in Florida. This guy is the fucking shit. I love everything this man has ever done. He's a fucking beast. I've got Cam Lee with me today. Fucking love this guy. We're going to be talking about the Mythos EP and a bunch of other cool shit that Masker's doing. Cam, it is a fucking honor, dude. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, no problem. Thank you. Dude, Thank this you. is so fucking cool. So let's go way back. Uh, let's go way, way back. Tell me everything just briefly. I know we don't have like tons of time, but tell our audience and me. I cannot wait to ask you this. What was it like, death metal, like when you started as as a pioneer in this genre? Okay, well, there was dinosaurs on the planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, actually, I, I, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, when I started this, it was 1980, the end of 1983, okay. 84, going into 84. Uh, here I am, a little punk kid, skate punk kid. Uh, it, it really started with tape trading. Um, we, t- we people, me and you know, guys are tape trading all over the all over the world. Tape trading was uh, back then. For for those of you youngins, there's this thing called cassette tapes, which a lot of us would record. <laughs> uh, um, albums but I, how it really started was i think there was a lot of college radio stations back then and the college radio stations would have one hour usually between midnight and one o'clock where these djs would come on and they would play the most obscure metal that they could get right um so you were getting a lot of stuff from overseas especially like early merciful fate um you were getting bands like venom bands that were really underground stuff back then even uh, stuff like accept early accept was was on there That's and you know awesome. like uh, bands out of of Canada, like um, Raven and, and uh, Razor, and all this kind of stuff it was really obscure stuff that no one had ever heard of because pretty, pretty much the only way you got exposed to metal was the radio or MTV because MTV was in its early prime back then. And uh, so w- there's a lot of tape trading going on, and uh, a lot of it came from, you know, influences because w- when we started, I, like, I started off being a, a drummer. And I was trying to like find a band that was going to. I'm a big Misfits fan, and oh, during awesome. that time, during that time, Danzig had left Misfits, and he had gone into doing Sam Hain or uh-huh. Saw Wayne. Yeah, and I I loved that first Saw Wayne album, and uh, I wanted to be in a band sort of like that. Of course, I had a generic name. You know, I'm I'm 15 years old, so when you're 15 years old, you come up with the most generic name. And I remember it was Invaders from Hell. So that's the band I wanted to to have something called Invaders from Hell. And I met a bunch of punk guys, and they weren't really into it. They were playing like stuff like The Police and Missing Persons and stuff like that. It was the 80s kind of like sure, new sure. wave. And I was like, oh, no, this is not what I want. I want to go darker and heavier. And I really couldn't find anybody at the time. Um, and I started tape trading with a bunch of guys, uh, punk stuff. And one of the guys from New York that I was tape trading with would integrate metal into it. And so he would send me a tape with side A would be all these hardcore punk bands like GBH and, and stuff like that and Agnostic Front and early stuff like that, Chrome Mags. Awesome. And then he would flip it. He'd say, well, try, check out side B and put on some metal stuff I think you might like. And I started getting exposed to metal that way. And I was like, you know, it was a lot of early thrash and stuff like that. But what really kind of got my attention was, of course, you put on the Merciful Fate, Nuns Have No Fun. So that just automatic. I, I really don't like King Diamond's vocals, but the, the lyrics are just so funny because they're spelling out, you know, <laughs> the C U N T. <laughs> sure. And I was like, okay. And then there was stuff on there that was kind of a little different, you know, Witchfinder General, which actually, believe it or not, to this day, I still like 
I don't know. It's so different, but I like Witchfinder General because of those old days. And then Integrated started getting stuff into, and I remember putting, he had a Bathory song on there and Hellhammer songs on nice. there from the early demo. And when I heard that, that's when I was like, oh man, that is what I want to do. That's what I want to do. Sure. That's, in, that's the kind of sound I want. And then, you know, I met, um, I met Freddie. Uh, Frederick in school and he knew uh, we started hanging out and he knew bands like Venom and stuff I was also a big Plasmatics fan and I remember the first time we went to school we went to work or not work but when we were school together we started talking and said hey let's go check out the record store so we went down to the record store together I remember at the time I was specifically was going down there to pick up Plasmatics Metal Priestess EP that was Love it. specific in my mind and uh, so I went down there looking for that and I remember getting it but I don't know, you're, you're old enough, you might remember back in the day when you go through the record store, you kind of, how you find stuff is you literally thumb through all the records looking for the coolest album cover. Absolutely. That's that's the way we did it back then. So here I am, I'm thumbing through all the stuff, and I finally get down, you know, I'm still holding the Metal Priestess uh, EP in my hand, and I'm thumbing through a bunch of stuff and finding all this other cool stuff. And I finally get to the V's, and I thumb through... And I find the ugliest album cover I've ever seen. <laughs> it's brown, and it pick it up, and it's got this pentagram and a goat head on it, and it's 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 Venom's "Welcome to Hell." And I pick it up, and I turn it over, and I flipped it over on the back side. There's a black and white picture, Cronus, Abaddon, Mantis, and they're on the beach. And I remember Cronus is holding like a, I think like a hatchet, and they're like picked their the photo. It's a really cheap back cover photo, and they're just on the back. And I was like. Well, I've got to listen to this. Plus, I'm looking at all the, the, the song lyrics, like, you know, uh, the, all the satanic stuff. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to take a chance. I actually put the plasmatics back, took a chance and bought the Welcome to Hell album, took it home and spun it and was just blown away. Oh, it's so good. I was like, this is, this is it. This is what I want to do. At the time, uh, Freddie knew he was going to parties, hanging out. I, I didn't really go out of parties and stuff like that. And he met... Chuck at a party. It's amazing. Well, Ch- and uh, he 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 met Chuck. And the thing was with me and Fred, we didn't have a place to to play. We didn't have a place to rehearse. I mean, he came over a couple times in my room. I had my drum set up in my room, but it's really not an ideal place to to rehearse, you know. And, and we went through a couple of Venom songs. I think we learned t- uh, early Venom songs. I, I can't remember what the first one we learned. But I remember Black Metal also came out. And, and Teacher's Pet was one of the very first ones that we learned That's off awesome. of the Black Metal album. <laughs> and uh, he met Chuck at a party one night. It was on a Friday night. He met Chuck on a Friday night. They got to talking, found out they had a lot in common as far as the kind of music they liked. He said, hey, I got a drummer. And uh, two days later on a Sunday, Sunday after, actually, at Sunday afternoon, I'm, I'm moving my drums into Chuck's garage. Oh, wow. So so Rick meets Chuck on a Friday night at a party. They, they did talk about things. I think we did a phone conversation on Saturday. Um, and then next thing I knew, Sunday, I was moving in my, my... And to celebrate that night, on a Sunday night, we went to the drive-in movie theater. And the drive-in movie theater was a double feature. It was Evil Dead and another movie called Nightmare. Fucking and, awesome. <laughs> yeah. And, and in... Because we got all together and we were really feeling the flow and, and positive energy, the first song we wrote together was actually two songs that we wrote together. Because Rick had brought it over two songs that he had, which are very Venom sounding songs, which was Demon's Flight and the song called Mantis, which we didn't have a name at the time. We just had the song called Mantis. Sure. So we just took the name Mantis from the song. Chuck and Rick together with me all wrote Evil Dead. Legion of Doom and Death by Metal. Awesome. And that literally is the first. That is the first Manus uh, demo right there. All those songs. That's amazing. They got Legion of Doom, Evil Dead, Death by Metal, Mantis, and Demon's Flight. All five of those songs became the first. And we just basically the demo was recorded on a boombox, an '80s boombox, live in a garage. It's Wasn't incredible. in the studio demo. It's just a just a practice recording. Unbelievable. And because we tape traded, and Chuck was also a tape trader, that's literally how we started getting things out. I was tape trading with a guy in New York, with a guy called Monty Connor. Uh-huh. He, uh, yeah, Monty's big time that went off to do Roadrunner Records and, and stuff like that. 
at the time he was in college and he did a college radio station i basically sent up you know the the manis demo i said here here's something for you to play on your, your radio <laughs> here's <laughs> go ahead and play this on your radio station one night and then that's literally how it, we just we just we were lucky i'll tell you right now we're three lucky kids that just happened to be there at the right time right when the whole scene was just you know it was blowing up and we just happened to be there at the right time with the right energy and just started just pushing our stuff out Incredible. of course you got you know later on you know the controversy through all everything else but that's literally how it started so it started good it started fun it started fresh and uh you know that's how it got it, it was it was a good start and like i said we were lucky just just we're lucky and the you know, and of course the controversy, which came first, possessed or death. And I said this before, possessed came first because we all heard the possessed demo in the tape training. We were tape training. We got sure. the possessed demo. And from the time of when we, and there, there's where you can hear the change because we were sounding different. We're sounding very much like Venom in the first Manus demo. Right. Very, very Venom cloning. As soon as we heard that Possessed demo, it was it was two bands, actually, that literally changed everything in death. The Possessed demo and Slayer Show No Mercy. Oh, Because yeah. those two things right there changed everything. Because once we heard Slayer Show No Mercy, as far as the speed and the aggression, and we heard Possessed, as far as the, the technicality of the guitars and the way that Jeff was singing, that's when we changed we took and said, okay, we need to be a combination of all three of these. We need to be a combination of the venom, the rawness of the venom, the fast ex ex energy, aggressive energy of Slayer, and that just evil, you know, screechy and guitar, you know, riffing ways of Possessed. That literally was it. There's the three bands that break, they're the, they're, they're the blueprint of death metal. That's, 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 that's far, that's far as I, I'm concerned. Now, were you were you all into any of you or Chuck or even Rick? Were you all into any of the Teutonic stuff that was going on, like Sodom or Creator? Or? Oh yeah, big time. Uh, especially especially Sodom. Uh, Sodom was another thing that in the Sign of Evil EP. As soon as we got that and we listened to that, and Destruction too, man. Destruction. Oh was yeah, big. Destruction's that great. Was, that was a, that was a big thing. Even though Destruction's more thrash, well, all of those guys are more thrash, but there was such something raw about it. Oh There's yeah, an energy about it. And that's what I think was really what we were gravitating towards. It's like, we want this energy. This energy is what we're talking about. It was just like, it wasn't so much about uh, talent. And what I liked about it is metal at the time was either hair metal or you had more stuff like, you know, Saxon, Maiden, uh, Black Sabbath. Sure. You know, you had, you had that kind of, but there was just nothing that was just that rawness of, punk where i was coming from and i really gravitate especially when discharge and i started hearing a lot of the swedish uh db punk kind of stuff right that's where where i was like man that's the kind of aggression i want that's the kind of drum drum you know beats that i want to play because at the time i was still a drummer so it, it was a it's a combination of all that stuff it's just a blender of stuff and tape trading really was a big part of it because we were getting bombarded by so many different bands weekly you know we'd wait for that tape to come in every because you know we didn't have the internet so we couldn't track sure. something back then you just sit there wait hey man i wonder if my tape's coming today wonder right. what's coming today <laughs> you know you just sit there rub your hands and you just wait and then you wait for the mailman and you're like you run out to the ma mailbox when the guy showed up and you're like oh man my package there and then <laughs> as soon as you saw somebody's tape package you run right back to the room stuck it in the tape player and just you didn't know what to expect. And everything was handwritten, too. So you're just looking at a handwritten little, you know, somebody's sloppy handwriting on, the, right. on a little titty card and trying to figure out, what does that say? Does that say, was it Sodom? Is that, you know, you're, you didn't right. know the band's names. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask you this, because what happened with me was I heard the first Deasod album. So I'm listening to like Exodus and Testament and all this Bay Area stuff. And literally, I'm, and I'm just being completely honest about this. I remember a friend of mine gave me the first Deicide album uh, on cassette. And I was like, I'm done listening to Thrash. Because I wanted the next most extreme thing. You know, I, I was I was like 15 years old. I was like, 
okay, fuck this. Like, I mean, nothing against those bands, but I was, I'm just being honest with you. Like, that's what got me going. And then it's, it's like, uh, the first death album I bought was Leprosy. Um, and then I had to go back and get Scream Bloody Gore. And then I think spiritual healing is what was out when I started right. getting into death. And, and, you know, it changed my life. I went and saw that tour. And obviously, DSI, I didn't end up seeing until Legion, and and I got into all of the you know the death metal stuff. But I, for me, and this is something I want to thank you for because Masker was definitely a part of this for me, and and obviously your contributions with Chuck. But I I just didn't have any interest in thrash anymore. I was like, oh my god, what is this? You know, like this is this is crazy because I was right. really into punk stuff too. I'm a big Misfits fan as well, and Sam Hain or Solon, however you pronounce it. And and I was like, "Oh god, this is fucking Cro-Mags. I like the crossover stuff. I like DRI kind of too." And but I loved death metal. Like as soon as I heard like that Deicide album, I know that's a weird one, the first thing I heard, but that was the first thing I heard was that Deicide record. I was like, "Oh my god, this is for me." You know. Right, right. And so for you, did did you like that all these other bands started coming out like Deicide and Morbid Angel and all that stuff or were you were you all feel like oh well a lot of this stuff's watered down or what was your thoughts on that like as the scenes coming in like like late 80s not early 90s like and you've all been doing it you know since the early 80s yeah let's well, see it was weird for me because like you got introduced to Deicide we knew those guys before they were Deicide we knew them once when they were Amon okay and you know so we knew a lot of these guys and and for us, it was different because you got to look at it like this way. It's almost like um, a whole new division of a sport starting off, right? And 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 we're like the we're like the pioneers. We're like the guys that were playing on on the, in the back lot and broken glass and asphalt and busted up knees and just junk, sure. you know. And everybody suddenly came upon and saw us doing this stuff, and they said, "Hey, you know, let's 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 make it better. Let's do this. Let's add this, and uh, let's 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 polish it up a little bit." You know, let's not play on the dirty asphalt anymore in the in the ghetto. Let's 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 bring it to the stadiums and inside right, right, right. and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, so for for us, it was like a little bit overwhelming because it was like, okay, all these guys, you know, two years ago were listening to Rat, and now <laughs> and, and now they're like, you know, now they're doing what we're doing, but like being extremely more extreme. You know, and it's just like, uh, for us, see, I, we came up with the same time Morbid Angel came up. So when, when we were, especially Massacre, well, once, once I was, because I, I, I went straight from, from death within a one month after getting kicked out of death to going to join Massacre okay. in 1985. Right. So here I am in 85, the end of 85, 86, 87, doing Massacre. And uh, like I said, all these other guys, besides Morbid Angel, they were like all the hair metal guys. You know, including obituary. And it was like all of a sudden, all these hair metal guys just, you know, stopped teasing their hair, stopped getting the hairspray, uh, stopped, you know, wearing the spandex and the, and the, and the bandanas right. and, and the eye makeup. And all of a sudden, they were just dressing like we were. And back then, the, the typical death metal wear was, especially in Florida, was white sneakers, sweatpants, t shirt, and a denim cut off jacket right that that's the i mean you literally, literally go back and look at all the pictures that's literally how you'll see james murphy wearing the same stuff <laughs> everybody that's basically the early death metal uniform before it turned into the, the the camouflage khaki shorts it was sweatpants walmart sweatpants black sweatpants white high top sneakers uh, a t-shirt of whatever your favorite band was with a with a levi's denim jacket with the sleeves cut off it's amazing the, er, the original early what they call battle vest and that was the that was the, the death metal uniform. So all of a sudden, it was kind of a gush. It was kind of a cross between what the Bay Area thrash bands were doing sure. and our own thing in here in Florida. So, uh, yeah, like I said, all these guys who were wear, wearing rat shirts and, and winger, you know, stuff. <laughs> all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you know, I'm not saying who, but I mean, there were some. You know, all of a sudden, you know, a couple of weeks later, after seeing us play a couple of gigs, especially that Rocky Point beach resort gig 1986 which is a big thing it's all over youtube yeah, it's amazing where we, where we played morbid angel played hell which now path from hell which was there i mean there were, like i said there was a, there was a handful of us doing the early death metal stuff and you're literally that's the show that's the fest that were all those bands that were yeah yeah um obituary there when they were still called executioner you know it was it was all of us uh kind of like i said i i it, it just was it 
was weird for, for me because, like I said, all these guys were like one time, one month they were all into this hair metal. The next month, all of a sudden, then they're, uh, they're death metal guys. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. What did, you, what did you think about the whole – so you've got the New York scene going on. Right. And then, you know, Cannibal and I guess Malevolent are like transplants into Florida, if I remember correctly. Yep. So what what did you think of the New York stuff? Did you did you, suffocation and that kind of stuff? Were, or immolation? Did you like any of those guys? Did you were you in? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The immolation guys we toured with, so yeah, I totally was 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 blown away by them. Even even the stuff coming out of like uh, I guess you would say dirt early, uh, I guess Pennsylvania and all that stuff like incantation. Oh sure, sure. Uh, all all that stuff, and then Will from Mortician. Uh, was totally a different level of stuff. By when Mortician came out, I said, "Okay, that's the most brutal shit. Nothing's gonna ever get more brutal than that." <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. That, that's 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 the cream of the crop right there, as far as brutality goes. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, there was a lot of that kind of stuff that we're just, and still, I still love today because there's just something about there's something fresh about that stuff. Even today, if you go back and you 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 listen to it, you can tell there's something. It's not. I don't want to say that the scenes become cookie cutter, and it's kind of hard when you. I mean, shoot, we're almost forty years into the scene now, so sure, it's like sure. it's hard to not to be original. But there was some original stuff going on back then, still that you could. Uh, for one, everybody didn't sound the same. There were, all the vocalists didn't try to sound pretty much like you know Glenn Benton. Now, sure. you know, there was a time where everyone had sort of a specific style a specific sound a specific way they did their voice and they were very different everyone was different and uh that's what i like it when everyone's when there's a little bit of difference you know where some nowadays you could put on three or four bands and i'm not ripping on them this is not me cutting anybody down right right in a row and then go back and say okay who was who and i'll be like i don't fucking know i have no (laughs) idea i couldn't tell you one band from the next we, you know, for me, I saw Cannibal pretty early on with, you know, with Barnes, and I get stoned for this to this day doing this podcast. That's the era of Cannibal I like. That's what I grew up with. I don't, I don't have anything against George and the stuff they do now, but I just, it's just not my thing. Like, if I'm going to listen to them, I'm going to listen to the first four things they did with Barnes. That's right. just, that's what I grew up with. That's what I like, and. I mean, again, it's nothing against George or what they're doing. It's just not what I'm into, you know. Like, right, right. I think yeah, it's gonna, you're gonna you're gonna gravitate to what you uh, you first are exposed to. That's what I've always felt. You're always gravitating. That's in a way that, that that brings us to massacre now. That's why when I got back finally in it, where I felt I was in the captain's seat. That's how I always try to say. I say finally I'm in the captain's chair. Fucking a. There was years I wasn't. And it's, it's evident that I wasn't. But so when I got back to it, when we came out with Resurgence and we came out with Mythos, the main thing I said was, I've got to bring out back that freshness that it was back when we released From Beyond. It, it, it can't be. It can't be just something, you know, that's just oh uh, well. I've heard this before. Typical. Even though it is, it is very retrospective. I purposely wanted it to be retrospective. I purposely wanted it to sound like it could have cost, possibly come out in 1992. Dude, Resurgence is the best album that came out last year. Thank you. It is a fucking monster. When I heard the fucking thing, I was like, oh my God. I mean, it's so good. And you know what? It is a love letter, I think, to 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 the scene. I mean, you you know what good death metal sounds like. And I, I want to praise you for that. And it, let's talk about this record. It's uh, research. It's goddamn. It's so good. Um, the writing process for resurgence, was that something you were doing during COVID or did you already have this stuff ready to go a long time ago or actually how the, it, it's, it's, it's so weird how everything, the world and COVID is, is, is a perfect example, how we didn't know what the hell was going to happen. And I can tell you with massacre, it was exactly like COVID. We didn't know what the fuck was going to happen. It just kind of happened, but in a good way, not in a negative way like COVID is. What had happened was I got back into the band pretty much at the end of, uh, I guess, 2016 would be if you went back to December. Right. Where Rick was trying to reform it, but it was done in a kind of a uh, sneaky way because Rick had a band called The End back then. 
And uh, he had his bass player, which is Michael Grimm, who I'm still friends with today, um, reach out to me and say, hey, the end's going to play uh, these couple of Masker songs on a show. Would you come out and like to do the vocals for him? Awesome. And I was like, okay, well, uh, first off, I better have a meeting with Freddie there because Freddie talks a lot of shit about me. <laughs> so I need to have oh, a meeting. Oh, no. <laughs> feel, feel it out and see how it goes. So we, it, it went, we had a meeting. It went well. Long story short, you know, I, I did the show. It went well. And then they asked me to come back to the rehearsal and uh, if I come back again to do, do it again. I said, sure. So it was, it was one of those weird kind of things where I ended up going to the rehearsal. Uh, they took a couple photographs on their phones. And the next thing you know, Blabbermouth's got it on the thing the very next day that Masker's back together. Oh, God. I'm like, wow. They, they just assumed that from a couple of photographs. And I said, so we just kind of went with it. To be honest with you, we were like, fine. If they're going to, they're going to post that we're back together, fine. We're, we'll, we'll be back together. Whatever. Right. And that actually, actually ends up starting a big controversy with, with Terry Butler at the time was no longer, because Rick and Terry had done their version of Massacre with Ed Webb and Mike Mazzanetto. Right. And that was back from beyond. And uh, so I was asked to come back after that. And um, it, it turned into a big whole, like, legal battle. There was a legal battle going on about the name. They claimed they had the name. Um I'm also, I'm, I'm a person, I don't like threats, so when you come and threaten me, and especially if you tell me, no, you can't do this, I'm going to go, you know, and find, okay, is this threat real? And I have a lawyer, so I, I was like, you know what, I'm going to see if my lawyer can find out about it, and sure. I did. I had my lawyer look into it, and he found out that no, they didn't have the name, they had registered for the name two days after the Blabbermouth article came out. So they didn't actually own the name, they only registered for it, um... It's a process. You can't just pick out a name and just say, okay, I'm going to go to the trademark and register and own the name. It right. actually has, it takes almost a year process to go through. It has got to go through a lot of legal red tape before it can actually be, you know, it has to have a, a, a time frame where it can be contested. You have to show that if you're going to use the name, you're going to use the name in commerce. There's a lot of stuff that has to be done. And I went through a lot of court uh, you know, hiring the lawyer and a lot of different court fees and everything to finally attain the name. And it took almost a year. Oh, to do shit. It. So I finally did. I finally did. So we did. We were, we were kind of quiet through 2007. I mean, there's a lot of like rumors. Uh, we were called Massacre X. We were called Gods of Death. And this is all because we had shows set up and promoters said, okay, well, we've already got you booked on these shows, but now. Uh, you've got these certain former members saying that you can't use the name Massacre. So actually, promoters started coming up with names. They were the ones coming up. <laughs> why don't you guys call it Massacre X? Oh, why don't you call it Gods of Death? And uh, you know, so every every month it seemed like there was a new name being pushed out there that we had changed the name to. And there's all and Wikipedia is one of the funniest places because it always has <laughs> it, it. It never has the true stuff. It, it's it all bullshit. <laughs> Yeah, it never has the facts. It just has like it has a fact, and then it has everyone else. It has like one sentence of fact around six sentences of assumptions. <laughs> God, <laughs> that's, literally, that's literally the internet for you, though. So um, th that was going on. So finally, long story short, got the name trademark, got the trademark, and uh, by that time. You know, three years had gone by. You know, we 2000, end of 2016, 2017, 2018, trademark, probably 2019, we started playing shows. We started playing shows. And uh, the, the first couple shows were okay. And then it just became worse and worse. And I'm only telling the truth. I'm not trying to, like... No, no, you're... Anything, sure, sure. Anything like this. But the performance-wise was becoming worse and worse. Um... You know, the guitar player at the time, Freddie, was just forgetting how to play the songs. I mean, and there's evidence out there. It's proof out there. It's on the Internet. It's not like it's hidden. The show in California was a fiasco. Um, the drummer wasn't playing the song. It was just was it, it was a mess. And for us being professional on a professional level, going out there and just playing like a, a garage band. Right. was embarrassing sure and not only for myself but for the fans it was a disappointment for the fans and i was like we can't just keep going out there and doing playing where, where somebody this person doesn't care so this person was confronted they were asked to straighten up their act and they ended up quitting instead 
So it left us in a bind because I had just negotiated a deal with Nuclear Blast to get a record out. Sure. And we had other obligations. We had a couple more shows that we had to finish up. We had shows in in, in uh, South America. We had lots of shows in, in Germany. Um, all these stuff that was booked. So we really quickly um, hired a couple other guys to come in to fulfill these shows. Unfortunately, again, I guess this this band is cursed. Those hired guys, those hired guns, those session musicians, right. Started taking it upon themselves to being in the band. You know, they they and all of a sudden one day, you know, while we're do, in between all these gigs that we're we're finishing up, they come to me and Mike Borders and they say we wrote the whole album. And we're like, what? <laughs> what do you mean you ho- wrote the whole album? Oh yeah, we did. We wrote the music. Here's the music. So it it, it it became a kind of like a thing where like. Okay, I have to. Go, I have these shows. I need to finish. Right. That's my priority. My priority is these shows. My my, my priority isn't thinking about the, the the album right now. So, you, and I made a decision, and the decision was I need to finish these shows. So I I placated the guys. I'll admit it. I placated them and said, okay, we'll work with it and see what we can do. But we really got to get these shows finished. I never never promised anybody anything. I said, let's just get. I kept saying, let's get these shows finished, and we'll see what happens next. Finally, the shows got finished up and Mike and I had agreed a long time ago we did not like the material we felt the material didn't represent Massacre properly it wasn't what and we didn't have any part of it I mean here's the two guys that are actually in the band we had no part in the writing so it was a decision together that Mike and I said said look we're not going to use these guys we're not going we can't we can't use these guys we can't use this music and uh we confronted them about it we told them Look, you know, you guys are brought in as session guys. You guys, uh, you know, you, a lot of these songs don't represent Massacre in the proper way. The guy blew up. The guy freaked out, had a like a little child, had a conniption fit and quit. Oh, my <laughs> so God. I quit, man. I quit. And, of course, those two guys went off to make In Human Condition, which is a real funny, that's a funny, <laughs> they quit. And, like, within a week, they went and got together with Terry Butler and got together with Rick. To, it's almost like they made they made that band out of spite. I'm right, gonna make right. a band out of spite. Right. And uh, yeah, it's totally like they did. So they took the song, the materials that they wrote for Massacre ended up being on their their material. They went and got two former members of Massacre to perform on the album. They actually used the font of the Massacre logo that was on the From Beyond album. And it's like the entire band, and they used a song title from the EP. <laughs> so it's, oh my god. <laughs> The whole band in human condition is like despite me. It's like so in in my sarcasticness, I think that's kinda of funny. <laughs> I think I actually yeah. laugh at it. It's like, oh, these guys are so angry at me that they spited me that they actually had to go out and create a band. And the guy tries to sound like me, by the way. Oh yeah, unfortunately I've heard some of that record. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that was, and you—that's the material they were trying to take to you and go, "Hey, this is the new master album." You're like, "No." Yep. God. Yep. Unbelievable. Exactly. exactly. That's exactly what it was. So that's what happened. There's the truth, right there. You can podcast on your podcast. You heard it. There it is, right there. And that's what happened. But to get back to resurgence, to get back to mythos, what happened was I've been working with a lot of individuals that have been great musicians for years. Sure. Rogo, Rogo Johansson, Johnny Patterson. We knew Scott Fairfax from Memorial for years. We were really good friends with um, Scott. And and Brian Jar Helgoton, who's the drummer, who's been the drummer in my projects, the, 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 the Grotesquerie, the Skeletal, all these projects I've done, all these recording projects I've done for years. Right. So I knew great musicians that knew what I needed as far as Massacre. And the main reason is that is these guys are Massacre fans. Every single guy that I got, the two guys in the human, in human condition hadn't even heard of Massacre. Oh, well, God. We, yeah, yeah. So when I got with, with uh, Roga, when I got with Johnny, when I got with Scott, when I got with Brinjar, I these guys all knew they were Massacre fans. They grew up as Massacre fans. Sure. You know? They, they know Massacre. They love From Beyond. They love Massacre. So they knew it. So it was very simple, very easy. When I asked them, I approached them, I said, would you guys help out and write the next Massacre album? 
and they were honored. All of them were like, of course. You don't have to ask us. Yes, we'll do it. Sure. So once they started coming up with the songs, it was easy because they knew the material, what kind of material, what the sound needed to be. So they started writing riffs. I've been doing this for years with Roga. It's very, you know, because we've done so many projects together since 2007. Sure. We kind of have a system down. And Roga writes everything to a click track. So there's a timing, and he sends me riffs, and he says, how, you know, do you like this riff? How many signatures do you want to do this riff? Um, do you want to use this riff as, as the main riff? Do you want to use this as the chorus? Do you mind if I throw this riff in as the middle part? A lot of it is like back and forth like that at the beginning. So we figure out the structure. He'll go down and make a checklist off of what riffs to use. And then I give him about a week. And about a week later, he comes back and he's got complete finished songs written. Wow. And the Johnny, same ways. Johnny was very much like, okay, what do you want me to do? And I told Johnny, I said, look, I want you to listen to the From Beyond. And I want you to listen to all the death metal before 1993. And you get a feeling of that kind of feeling, you get that kind of vibe, that's what you go with. And and, and it literally came out simple. It wasn't it wasn't where there was anything that was weak. Every song that they wrote was powerful and strong. I think maybe out of because together collectively there was eighteen songs written. We kept fifteen. Wow. Just the way we went. And we added more. We added a couple of things like uh, Ruins of Arlay. That that entire ending. The way that that ends, yeah, that wouldn't have been that way unless Scott put his Scott Fairfax put his little lead at the end, and it just totally brought it elevated that song. And like, oh man, now that he did that, I've got to do some vocals at the end. And that, I mean, it, it was it's it simply was simply working together with everybody on the same page, everyone having the same mindset, everyone being fans of the band and knowing what the sound needed to be. Right. So it relatively became very simple, real easy. So the resurgence lineup, you still have that lineup intact then? Now, what's going on is that that's the recording lineup. Those are the guys that recorded resurgence, also recorded mythos. Okay. But as far as performance lineup, I have a completely different lineup. Really? That, that performs, yes. That's fantastic. So you've got some guys that you work with creatively in the studio, and then you've got a completely different live band. Yes, that's incredible. Mike Borders, Mike Borders, well, Mike's actually stepped down currently right now because of personal, but he's still in the band. Mike has stepped down to because he has um, he's got family members that are very ill, and he's taking care of them. Oh, okay. And it was, it was a decision that we all came together and said, "Look, okay, Mike, we understand, but you're always still going to be a part of the band because Mike remains the band manager right now." Okay. Yeah, and he's been done a great job as a band manager. He's the booking manager and also the band manager. He runs all the social uh, media pages. Okay. And I told him, I said, Mike, I don't want to lose you because you have responsibilities to your family. Sure. I understand it. I've taken care of my mom, so I understand it. So he's got a very ill father and a very sick brother that he's now taking care of. So he asked to basically go on a sabbatical to take time off to do this. And I said, yes, I want you to do this, but I also would like you to remain and stay active as the band manager. Sure. So that's what he's currently doing. And yes, I have a completely new lineup for for uh, performing for shows. Did you? Is that hard to put a band together to do that, or or was that easy for you to go put a, a, a like a live massacre band together? It's, it's, it's a little difficult. It's a little difficult. We went through several different people till I. Rock. It's funny too because the guitar player that we have now, Carlos Gonzalez, is the guitar player that I wanted originally to replace when Rick stepped out. Okay. And, Rick quit. and uh, it, it, we, we auditioned a bunch of different guitar players. He was the one that I really wanted, and we ended up not keeping him. But once the other two in human condition guys left, I went right back and said, we got to get Carlos back in the band. Sure. At the time, Carlos was in his other band, Grim Reality, and I didn't really want to pull him away from that, so I ended up using uh, two guys... I, Tony Black, who's from Druid Lord, he's uh -huh. the bass player and vocalist in Druid Lord, stepped in to play guitar for a while, and Druid Lord's drummer, Eldon Santos, stepped in to do the drums. So that's currently the lineup now, is Eldon Santos, Tony Black, who's now moved over to bass since Mike Border stepped down, and Carlos Gonzalez, who's now the guitar player. Gotcha. 
Gotcha. And then for Mythos, um, was it was this just a a, a beaut? Because it feels just like a beautiful transition between Resurgence to Mythos. It feels like so natural to me when I listen to the new EP. Was was that the the writing process on that? Was it any different than Resurgence, or was it? No, it was exactly the same. It's the same lineup as Resurgence, so it was very very much the same. Very very simple. Same lineup, and also the same. Dan Swano also mixed it, so same production and stuff. Yeah, the production is fucking dope, man. It's awesome. It sounds so fucking nasty. Um, do you, as far as um, doing live stuff, are you pretty selective about that? Doing shows now, or do you just kind of? Is it is it as you as you've gotten older? Is it is it harder to be like, well, I don't want to go here, or maybe yeah, we should go here, or? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, mainly what it has to do with, uh, and, uh, you know, here's the truth that maybe a lot of musicians will never tell you, <laughs> I don't know, or maybe they will, I don't know, is it all depends on if the promoters are generally, you know, good guys, or are these just, you know, nobodies that are just trying to do it and have no good reputation. And it really has to do with that. And that's why we're going through an agency right now. Um, we're going through the Flaming Arch agency right now as Excellent. far as, as booking our shows. Because, uh, you know, we try, we've tried it for years, trying to do it ourselves. And you end up with shady promoters. Um, I, if you know my history, I've, I've always had a bad thing with promoters. I've got a really bad... Because <laughs> I've worked with shady guys. That, what you, I hate to chase my money. I sure. Think that's a, I have. I do not like to chase my money. Sure. And what you know, you get done with a show, you go out, you fly out to do a show, or you go on a tour and you go do a show, and at the end of the day, when the promoter's supposed to pay you and he's not there, you know, and all of a sudden you're not getting paid and you're having to chase your money, that gets a little annoying. And so I got tired to the point where I was like, uh, if I have to chase my money, I'm not going to do it. Right. You know, right. If I'm, yeah, I need to be working with legitimate, legitimate promoters. So Mike does a lot of, a lot of groundwork to try and find guys that have a good reputation, guys that have, you know, that are known to be out there. Now it doesn't always happen. Even some of the guys with the halfway decent reputations, we've, we've still had to like chase after. Them. Right. Hey, where's, where's, where's our pay, man? We, you know, so it's, it comes to a point where, you know, I've always used to think. Back as a punker, you know, I used to think, okay, it's fun. We're going to go out there. We're going to play the show, do our best. It doesn't matter. But as you get older, you're like, I got bills at home. <laughs> I got to, I got to figure out. I got to like figure out the budget. Figure out what I need. Am I going to get paid? And if I don't get paid, that means that's a whole long list of other things that aren't going to get paid. And I may be going home to no food and no electricity if I don't get paid. So right. There's a lot of considerations. Yeah, when you get older, you got to start thinking about outside of the box it's not no longer oh this is just for the fun and going out and getting you know playing and you know uh no now i now i'm thinking about okay what do i have to pay next month um <laughs> what's coming up what you know okay okay i got car insurance coming up i've got uh you know mortgage coming up sure i got yeah yeah it's like all this other new stuff that gets like added in it, it's yeah that sounds boring there's no musician that wants to hear that but that's the reality of it. You got to actually start thinking about that kind of stuff. Hey, man, if you if you gave them the goods, you give them the Ray Liotta's character from Goodfellas. You're like, fuck you, pay me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you, yeah. you, you did you did your part. Where's my money? You know, so. Well, let me ask you this on on Mythos, uh, like the first track on here, uh, behind the the Serpent's Curse. What a what a fucking awesome track that is what can you tell us about that track that's just a great song that track is actually very personal it's and, awesome uh, yeah it, 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 it works on, on a, several different levels um mu lyrically mu musically it's 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 one i knew was really catchy and uh when we wrote it i was like i really want to get another vocalist involved and i ended up it just ended up working out that i got anders odin and anders odin has such a very cool and unique voice and it differs from mine so i felt that that was going to be a good flip you know flipping back and forth between the vocal lines sure which had always been my intention from the from when i wrote the, the lyrics lyrically it's uh it's it's the most personal song i don't like writing stuff that's just like okay Here's a situation. I, I use Lovecraft as metaphor. Sure. Uh, I, I use a lot of the, a lot of the stuff. So Lovecraft is always the 
I guess you can say the the main ingredient to my lyrics. Okay. Though a lot of it might not be directly, you know, direct from a Lovecraft story. I just use the influence of it, and I use my own uh, metaphors, using Lovecraft as metaphors to express a lot of uh, my nihilism, <laughs> my <mis> <laughs> okay, my cynicism, uh, a lot of that. So I use that kind of imagery because I feel like it was so it's something you know a little bit different, um, and and. And uh, I can use that imagery kind of to express it in that way. So behind the serpent's curse, uh, lyrically, the, the basis is based on a story called The Curse of Yig, which is a Lovecraft story about okay. a snake. But for me, uh, in everything, I, I kind of like, okay, the snake represents things. Biblically, it represents the devil. Uh, it, um, Native American Indians said if you lied, you were speaking with a forked tongue like that of a snake, of a serpent. Sure. sure. Um, so to me, a serpent or snakes represent people that are liars, people that are backstabbers, people that are two-faced, and that's why there's a twin-headed alabaster snake, a two-faced snake, one body with two different faces. So there's a lot of that going on, which personally, what I, we went through from with Massacre, with former members, I felt there was a lot of backstabbing, a lot of two-faced stuff going on. And it, ironically... Anything that happened to do with those people was always done by two guys. There was two. There was two people always involved. Right. There were yes men, and the, there was the guy that was leading everything, and the guy that was always the yes guy, the guy that was behind the other guy, going, "Yeah, man, that's the way it should be. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah." And it always reminded me of that little cartoon with the little dog and the bulldog and the little dog from the <laughs> from the cartoon. And there was that little dog going, yeah, Chester, yeah, Chester, I'll do anything, Chester, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was that guy, and there was the Chester dog who thought he was the cool guy, the big tough guy. Right. You know, pulling the toothpick out of his mouth and just saying, yeah, man, that's the way I'm going to do it. And if we don't do it that way, I'm going to smash this guy. So that's the kind of people I had to deal with in this band, and I felt that Behind the Serpent's Curse was the perfect way to write about that experience of being having to deal with and these guys also building their own little sycophant fan base having their little yes men themselves so that's all in the lyrics if you really delve into those lyrics <laughs> it's it is fucking awesome dude that song is so good uh what can you tell us about the second track the dunwich horror dunwich horror is just generally old school death metal it is it is one thing that i said roga wrote that one and i said roga i just need a short and sweet song that's just going to hit that core of that old school death metal sound. And lyrically, I said, you know what? I'm just going to go and write it about the Dunwich Horror. That's one of my that's one of my favorite Lovecraft stories. I'm just going to make it simple, but I'm going to take it from a different perspective. Everyone always, if they try to write something about the Dunwich Horror, which is very hard to write about because literally the Dunwich Horror is a big invisible fiend that kind of like uh, comes out at the end, which we're it doesn't ever really say in the story what it is, but. Um, right. uh, the the main thing that really, I really liked about the story was there was, there was this old wizard, uh, Waitley, and he had a daughter that was an albino uh, Lavidia, and she gave birth to two twin sons. So I felt that the twin thing was still attached to that because I had done Behind the Serpent's Curse, what happened to do with two faces, two people, and this happened to do deal. This song happened, song and story happened to deal with twins. One that was a monstrous son that was so hideous it was hidden away. And another one that was still monstrous, which is Wilbur, who was more like a child, a goat child. And I just basically used that, that, that concept of the twins and also just taking the Dunwich, the core of the story of the Dunwich horror about Lavidia giving birth to these two abominations. Oh, it's so awesome. And again, what a, what a just stomp your nuts track. It's so awesome. Yeah, uh, thanks. Yeah, yeah man, like I, said, I told Rogue, I just needed something that was just one of those kind of like in your face, old school death metal tracks that it just is like, bam, there you go. That's what it's all about. Absolutely. It's great. And then uh, track three, uh, the mythos that Lovecraft built. Yeah. Okay. That song is obviously my, you know, it's my salute to, to Lovecraft. Awesome. Uh, yeah, that's literally, literally what it's about. It's, it's just like, it's just my, me praising Lovecraft, everything I felt that Lovecraft emanates. And it's all in the chorus from the very first lines about, um, behind closed eyes in the darkness, which I feel is like the smallest thing that is your childhood fears, the things that you don't see, the things in the dark. 
to Lovecraft's cosmic horror, to the things that are, you know, in outer space, the cosmic things, uh, and and where the planets align. So it's like I try to like think of which. How can I sum up everything that Lovecraft did in one friggin' chorus? How can I do it? <laughs> and that's what I did. I kind of like said I'm going to just sum up everything that Lovecraft means to me in one song. That that's a that's a ripper too, man. That's a really really good song. Yeah, that's actually what that song was written actually during the Resurgence era. And really, I was, almost put it on Resurgence. We, I said, man, I think I was almost almost that almost was the title track of Resurgence. To put okay, the but then I felt, man, this song is so strong and cool by itself. We need to save it right. <laughs> for, for 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 later. It's awesome. Uh, and then of course the last track on the EP, the thing on the doorstep. The thing on the doorstep, another one that this time I went and told, I, I had Johnny write that one. Same sense, I said, Johnny, we need, just need to write a song that's just pure death metal, old school. Just old school death metal, something that you could pull out and write. And that one actually was the trickiest one for me. Out of all the songs I saw in the Resurgence all the, and the songs on Mythos, that one was the trickiest because I didn't really know lyrically what I wanted to do. But then I remembered the story, which is basically the title, the thing on the doorstep from Lovecraft, and I remembered again, there is in the story, the concept of the story is uh, the main character trusting his friend and having his friend end up being something that he's not. Right. And I think, okay, that that totally goes with the, with the other two songs on Mythos, which is Behind the Serpent's Curse and The Dunwich Horror, as for having that du- duality kind of thing going on. Having the one face on one side which acting as your friend, and then on the other side. Now, the story in, in the story itself, the Lovecraft story, is his friend ends up dying and coming back and, uh, you know, at the doorstep. And the key thing about the doorstep, and that's why it's in the chorus, is the code that they use to knock on the door. And it started in college, where they would knock three times, pause, knock twice, and knock three times again. Uh-huh. That was that code, so they knew that that was their friend at the door. Right. You know, tap, 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 tap. So I used that in the course. I said that in the course several times um, about that code, because that's kind of the code to tell you, hey, Gabe, this is your friend. But, okay, deeper, what's the existential about the song the deeper thing about the song is even that somebody can be your best friend could fuck you over i mean that's just literally what it is oh you know, yeah be, care- be careful even someone who you think you could trust and is your best friend are they really that person at the door just like the thing on the doorstep was in the story it does the knock three times twice uh-huh. three and he answers the door that story always ends lovecraft story always end with that cliffhanger ending where you never know what happened the guy opens the door and there's this creature there, you know, and that's how the story ends. And I felt like that was the surprise of, hey, when your friend fucked you over, hey, I thought you were my best friend, but you fucking dicked me over. You know, you slept with my wife, you, you stole money from me, whatever it is. There's people out there that will do that, no matter how much you think you could trust them. Dude, that song, as much as I love it, has a whole new personal meaning for me. Thank you. Because, and I want to share this with you real quick if it's okay. So back in 2018, literally two days ago in 2018 on August 2nd, I ended up going to jail for like a month. And and I didn't do anything. My dad had a restraining order against me because my mom had Alzheimer's. And he and my brother basically cooked up a bunch of bullshit, got me tossed in jail up in Tennessee. And my cellmate just... Not to go into a long thing with this, but I thought you'd appreciate this. God, what a what a great meaning that that your song is for me right now, and in this time of year because it always makes me haunt back to just a terrible thing. I spent my birthday in there, dude. It was it was fucking horrible. But it's funny. He told me he's like, you can call these people if they don't bail you out. They're not your fucking friend. And I got left in there. Yeah, left in that motherfucker. And that wow. So that puts all. And I'm sorry, but it's just this time of year and. I hope you can appreciate the spin on that that has for me because it's like, you know, what is what is on the doorstep? It's like exactly, exactly. That's what it. That's what I mean. A lot of people say, "Oh, Cam just writes these goofy ass lyrics about horror and stuff," and it's like, well, my friends that know me know the little bit deeper meanings behind this stuff. <laughs> there's a little, there's a little bit more deeper meanings. I just don't want to be one of those guys that write just boring. Oh, I got it. I wrote what he, I read what he. Hey, look, it's death metal. My lyrics aren't going to change the world. 
They're not. <laughs> I don't think there's any death metal band out there that's going to be, oh, wow, I read the lyrics and it changed my life. Sure. I mean, maybe maybe it does, and if it does something for somebody, that's great. It has, when I write lyrics, they just have little personal things about me. Most of it, like I said, is about my nihilism and my misanthropy. Sure. <laughs> most, of it, most of it. But, you know, I, there are some deeper meanings in some things that nobody would ever get unless I explain it or unless you knew me personally. Um, would you kind of get I have a good friend of mine, Sly from Fondle Course, that always reads my lyrics and goes, I know what that was about. <laughs> and I'm, like, you do? I'm like, you do? And he's always surprising me. Yeah, I know exactly who you were talking about in this. I know who you were. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. As far as the cover art for Resurgence and Mythos, where did that come from? Okay, well, with, with Resurgence, I really wanted to use Wes Ben Scotter. I saw what he was doing with Autopsy and a lot of the other bands sure. he was working with. And I said, that's a guy I really want to work with. And at the time, Nuclear Blast was like, oh, we know him. Um, do you want us to get in touch? I'm like, yeah, that'd be great. Got an email. It's amazing how things, if you just ask in the world, let me t- let me put this out there for everyone that's listening to your podcast. Anyone ever has a doubt of ever anything in your life thinking, ah, man, I'm not going to ask because they're probably going to say no. No doesn't hurt you. No does not hurt you. If somebody says no, brush it off. You'd be surprised how many times if you just ask, you will get something good in return just by asking. Don't ever be afraid to just say, hey, man, would you be into this? Because you'd be surprised how many people would probably say, yeah, that's great. I'll do it. That's what happened with the Wes. I didn't know Wes. Right. I just said, I really like his art. Let me see. Well, let me hear. Uh, Nuclear Blast got me an email. He wrote me. And I said, hey, man, uh, I really like your art. I love what you do. Um, this is the concept. I really want to do something. I'm really into Lovecraft. He wrote back. Hell yes! I love Lovecraft, and I've never got a chance to do something Lovecraft. I want to do it. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like I said, you never know what, what you, you expect. As far as Mythos goes, Mythos is an uh, artist, Timbo Cajoni, who I've worked with, Bull Metal Art. I've okay. worked with him on all my singles, all of the singles that we've done. Um, he's another artist that's just been a really great friend and a great guy. Um, very easy to work with and is always excited to do anything and all my ideas and a lot of the stuff when it came to mythos I just generally said look man I want to do something that just celebrates Lovecraft and he's like okay let me do a sketch and he's one of those guys that he'll say let me do a sketch and I'm thinking okay it'll take about a you know, week before I get a sketch back usually it's about a day a day later and he sends me a sketch huh. and I'm like Man, it's, it's like, are you reading my mind? You got it exactly. It's amazing. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's generally just like that. Having open, you know, conversations with people, not afraid to express yourself. You'll find people out there that get along and, and, and have the same kind of, like, likes and, and things that you do. It's, and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you find assholes. <laughs> it's just right. like, right. you got to pull those assholes out. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, and you, you wanted to, and I'm, I'm so curious about this. I'm sorry we <clears throat> I, I didn't mean to talk to you for so long. It's been an honor, though. I'm absolutely enjoying every minute of this. I can't thank you enough for this. But uh, <clears throat> I wanted you to talk about your uh, your digital singles you're doing. Right. Yeah, we, we've done, ever since I got back, you know, Massacre going, I say since 2020, when it's really gotten on its feet and really gotten, we decided to do digital singles kind of like the way that the old school bands did demos. Okay. Uh, we love to do it, do it yourself. We don't want to rely. I know everybody says, it's weird. How are, you, how are you on a label, but you're releasing all this stuff? Well, a label is just there to help you. They're, they're, they're help with your distribution. They help you get your stuff out on a bigger scale. But I've always come from that old school. And maybe that's the punker in me again. I've come from that old school do-it-yourself kind of thing. And it kind of makes it sort of feel uh, more... Uh, organic, I guess you could say, more okay. real, yep. where where you can release stuff in your, with yourself. I, I know this is totally off base, real quick, and I, I don't want to stay too long. But one of the one of the people that I've always admired is Prince, and I used to watch a lot of interviews with Prince. Prince had a lot of trouble fighting himself with the record label. He hated sure. the record labels. He felt if you watch any of the old interviews, he'd tell you. And Prince said something to me that's always stuck with me. And he said, there's two types of people in entertainment, especially when it comes to music. He said, there's musicians 
and there's performers. Performers are the guys that get out there and they get up on stage and they just like to play and they perform. They like to hear the audience or whatever. But then there's musicians. Musicians don't really care too much about the performance as much as they care about writing the music and creating the music and recording the music. I more or less feel that I'm the musician. The performance side of it is great, but it's not what I crave. I don't crave to hear, have the audience, the crowd, to be up on stage. I crave creating and writing music and creating new music and completely making new music all the time. So doing the singles was our way to kind of say, this is us in control of our own music. This sure. is us controlling our own stuff, being able to do what we want to do. And that's the reason why we've done the singles that we've done. And we'll continue to do. We'll continue to do them. Like we have a new one coming out called Casket Mutilations. Uh, the digital will be coming out on our Bandcamp page on September 1st. And then later on, we'll be releasing a 7-inch vinyl version of it through 7 Metal Inches Records. Awesome. And also, I also like to do kind of limited runs on CDs, where I do about 100, 200 CDs to kind of get out there. And that way, they're kind of like for the hardcore fan. They're for the collector that later on, 50 years from now, when I'm fucking bones in a grave somewhere, <laughs> somebody can say, hey, man, I got that Rare Massacre uh, EP uh, single that they put out when uh, Cam was doing it all by himself. Do you have? that no man i ain't got that where'd you get that i'm like yeah man i bought it back 50 years ago <laughs> yeah so that's that's what i like to do dude you are you are literally a living legend to me i mean I've, I've been such a fan for so long i remember when i got my hands to go back you know to the first ds i remember getting from beyond about a uh about a year later a uh cassette copy of it and i i played it so much the fucking thing broke okay so, you know, it's 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 an honor. I love what you're doing. Keep doing it, man. I, like I said, Resurgence was my favorite record that came out last year. Uh, Mythos is fucking awesome. And I've got to start checking out these digital. I had no idea you were doing that. I'll get out there and promote that for you as well. I had no idea. It's so fucking cool. Because I'm kind of... Just go to our, it's confusing. Massacres also have been, you know, we have a confusing... Now, we have our own band camp site, which is basically... Massacre three, so all lowercase massacre three dot bandcamp dot com. That's okay. our that's our website. That's our actual because you know Earache has their own band massacre site. Uh, uh, Century Media has their own massacre site. It's like every label that's ever put stuff up has their own, and it gets confusing for the fans because massacre's been broken up so many different times. Sure, but now, but now that I'm back in and I I now 100 percent own the trademark. It is under my name. It's under my control. I'm going to try my best to make Massacre, to bring back the legacy that it, it's always deserved to have. You know, I don't want to be like uh, big headed and say that we're a legend, but it, Ma Massacre you has are. a legacy. It has a legacy, and I, I want to preserve that legacy. And I'm doing the best I can now to preserve that legacy. Dude, I'm serious. I can't tell you what it was like to, to find out the resurgence thing was coming out, that it was you. And I was like, because. And I want to, and I'm not trying to keep you, but I've, I've got to ask you this because it'll eat away at me the rest of my life if I don't. Because if I never get to do another interview with you, I hope I do. But if I don't, it'll kill me if you don't mind me asking you one more thing. Okay, go ahead. So, the death to all thing. There's all these different like tribute things to Chuck, and you played with Chuck early on and whatnot. And then, I, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, there was some version of Massacre that was out with Death to All, if I remember correctly. Right, um, with with Rick and, and Terry. Right. What are your thoughts on all these people? Like, it feels like to me. And again, I'm 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 going to be 48 next week. Okay. Um, I would love to hear what your thoughts are on. It feels to me, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but I, I grew up listening to Death. I saw Death multiple times, um, and was a fan. And I know you, you know, played with Chuck. Does it kind of feel like a bunch of people are trying to just cash in on him? Because it does to me. And again, I hope I'm not being offensive to you. I was just curious oh, what no, your thoughts no, no, were. No, no, no. You're not being offensive at all. And, and, and I'm going to be one of those people. I'm very frank. This is why a lot of people hate me. I love it because I'm the I, same I, way. <laughs> I tell the truth. I tell the truth. I don't sugarcoat nothing. People hate me because I don't, I don't sugarcoat nothing. I love you want, for it. 
people want to hear what they think they want to hear. They don't want to hear the truth. And when you start telling them the truth, that's when all of a sudden you're an asshole. Right. What? Okay, here it is. You said it. Your own words. Cash in. Okay? I was asking another interview recently, and had I been asked would I have done it, and I said absolutely not. No, I would never do it. I'd never do it. I don't want to rely, first off, on uh, Chuck's legacy to, to make money. Sure. If I can't, if I can't, if I, if I can't make music myself, if I can't write it myself, why would I try to cash in on on something? Secondly, um, you know, like I said, if I was asked, I would I would have refused to do it. I wouldn't even do it now. I won't do. I won't be a part of anything like that now. Um, a lot of people know there's been a lot of controversy between Rick loves to spin and, and uh, his agenda. His, his, and his agenda is always to like to uh, shit on me as much as possible. <laughs> right, he, right. He can, always seems to do, and he uses blabbermouth as a platform to do it, which, uh, whatever. But, um, you know, sadly, here's the thing. It, it sucks that uh, Rick and I couldn't get along. It, I, I'll admit that. It sucks. It sucks that we can't. We have different personalities that don't work. We have clashing personalities, and it happens with people. And unfortunately, it's unfortunate for the fans. That's what I think is the worst about it, sure. because the fans, the fans would really would have, would have wanted it, would have been nice for the fans. And I'll just put it to you this way: I worked with him for three years, three years prior to this all coming together, from the end of 2016 through all of 2017, all of 2018, all of 2019. He never wrote a new song in three years. Wow! And I'll just let it leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. So I don't think he even cared when he got back in touch with me to do Massacre for any reason other than to cash in. Right. And it's, it's, it's ironic that he used me to try and make money. Then when he realized he couldn't get what he thought he was going to get, he then started to shit on me. And that's the kind of person he is. And I'm just like letting you know that's my opinion of him. That's exactly what happened to me. There's nothing more of me. It's not me trying to tell you not to listen to him, not to support him, not to go out there. No, if you like his stuff, you like the sure, stuff that he sure. does, go out there and support him because he needs it. He ain't got nothing else. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You know, give him his sandwich money. He needs it because he's got nothing else. But it's, that's not me talking shit on him. That's just the truth. But, yeah, I, no, I, I do think it's exactly what you said. I've always felt that all of it is. Uh, it's sad that it's gotten to that point. It's sad that, you know... It's disrespectful to everything he did. I know. It is. It's complete. It's exploitation. Exploitation to the top. It is exactly what exploitation means, is what's going on. But here's the thing. The fans don't seem to care. The fans that keep showing up... Oh, I know. it's It's almost like they're there just for the clown act. They're going to the circus for the clown act. They know, as I, there's, you can't tell me that there's that many dumb fans out there. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, is it, is it, I mean, I, I wonder myself. I scratch my head, right? And you got fans that will defend it. You got fans that will say, oh, no, they deserve it. I'm like, I'm like, okay, sure. If that's how you feel, I'm not going to tell you how to feel one way or the other, but man, you know, fair, all fair, all fair, you know, look at it from both sides of it, you know? Looking from our side of it, how we're expressing it, it does seem very exploitive. I'll tell you what I said. We started this podcast in like fifteen, sixteen. I'll tell you exactly what I said when they announced that death to all thing. And, and again, you know, it's it's not my place to say this, but I'm an older fan, and I did see him on multiple tours. Chuck, I just to me, it felt like grave robbing. Yeah, yeah, it is. It does feel that way. You and know. I, I, it just it, it it's just uh, definitely seems that way and it's just weird and you, you know what's really ironic is if, if you try to approach any of them with it they're going to defend it and tell tell you exactly why they have the right to do it oh yeah they will never tell you oh it's because i, I uh, the truth is that they hide behind the a whole okay it's it's for honor it's for a tribute but if you ask them truly, they'll tell you, they won't even tell you about the honor and tribute. They'll just automatically go straight to, well, I have the right to do it because, oh, uh, this and that. Right. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, and you'll get a kick out of this if you haven't heard this. You probably have, but 
it's it's like them talking about doing a Van Halen reunion when, and Eddie's in the ground. You know, it's like. Oh yeah. <laughs> how, the, how the fuck are you doing a a fucking Van Halen reunion? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just like the Pantera. Oh reunion. my god. Oh my god. That that's another one. It just I don't understand that at all. I, well, you know, it's I, man. I really think it's become it's it's gotten to a point because you're you are old enough to know this. Uh, everything our scene has just it's gotten to the end. It, we are watching it become everything that we hated. Everything that we stood against is becoming. Yeah. It's become a, it's become a commodity. It's 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 become McDonald's. It's a it's fucking cash Starbucks. grab. It's Starbucks. <laughs> it's exactly it is it goes star that metal is Starbucks. I mean, did you ever think that you'd walk into a mall and see a death metal shirt? Cannibal Corpse. Oh I know. Death shirts. Selling that hot topic. I, I never in my life thought I'd see that. The no. day I saw that I said Death Metal's dead. Fucking Death Metal's dead. Yeah, it's I mean, it's <laughs> It's 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 awful. It's like product placement. It just feels like, and yeah. it's it's the you know the worst thing, Cam, is it's it's so fucking insincere, unsincere. It is, yeah. And I, I and I and I don't know how you feel, but as a as a fan, you know, I know I know you you're you're a forefather of this genre, but for me, I just feel like someone's spitting in my face. Yeah, and and and, and it's true. And the sad thing is, those people that are spinning don't even care. They're spinning in your face. Oh, I know. That's what's even, that's what's even worse. <laughs> and like they feel that they have the right. It's their it's their right to spit in your face <laughs> because you have an opinion. Oh no, you're not allowed to have an opinion. But goddamn, I'm going to do this because I'm entitled to do this. Right. That's exactly what it says. Is exactly what it is. They feel entitled to do it because, oh, you know, I, I saw Chuck. You know, I sat and I sat on the bus with Chuck in high school, so I'm entitled to do this. It's like almost it's that. <laughs> I just I, I just find it really interesting. Um, I had I did an interview a few years ago. We we only did the one interview. Um, the dude from uh, uh, Repulsion. Yeah, yeah, Scott. Yeah, so we we did a really good interview, and he said something that I think you would love. He said at the end of my interview, he said, uh, he goes, you know what, man? It was fun talking to you. You get it and all this stuff. But he goes, people can go out there and try to mimic what, what, what has been done in the past, but if you didn't grow up in the scene, you don't get the scene. Exactly, yes. You don't. And that's why, dude, that's why, and I will say this again, Resurgence and Mythos are must-owns, kids. Thank Ca you. Let Cam Lee teach you about some death metal. <laughs> dude, I did not mean to talk to you for so long, but God, it, God damn, this has been a great interview. I can't thank you enough for doing this. All right, no problem, man. You're a fucking living legend to me. Kids, again, Mythos is available from Nuclear Blast Records. So is Resurgence Massacre. Cam Lee, the real guy. Here he is. Dude, thank you for doing this. Alright, thank you. And you know something? I sort of enjoyed it. Phantasm.